Welcome to Accounting Life with Jotham Tai. Today's episode is How Accountants Add Value. Our guest today is Nick Corradino, Manager of Solutions Consulting at Tipalti. On this episode, we discuss how the skills and experience gained through an accounting career add value to an organization and why the future is bright for those in the profession. Now, our host, Jotham Tai. Hey, Nick. Welcome to the Accounting Lab podcast. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing really good. Thank you for having me. I've got a fun few minutes here of, of sharing accounting stories. And I always am fascinated by everyone's accounting journeys. You know, got a preview about uh, how you got started and you know, obviously where you're at now. But I you know, really want to turn it back to you and you know, maybe just very briefly talk about kind of like the, uh, the you know, two minute trailer of what Nick's accounting jury, uh, journey has been like. Yeah. So, for me, it's funny. I took my first accounting course in grade 11, which is, I guess, a senior in high school. Uh, found it really easy, continue with that through university, took a specialization in accounting, went to a big four accounting firm at a school, became my CPA, and then went straight to industry. Uh, it was there when I found, I guess, my love for technology because we were, uh, you know, different processes had constraints. We had to optimize certain processes. Either today you outsource it or you implement technology that helps uh, so that's where I found Topalti back then, uh, and now six years down the road, I guess five and a half years down the road, if you include when I was a customer for it, but uh, I'm here now in, in the world of sales as a CPA, so it's, it's awesome. That's amazing, and I, I know, obviously, from our perspective, and Dapifying, our, our role in the market is to share new information and technology that's available uh, you know, to the market that you and I came from, and I think we play a critical role in the ecosystem. Uh, but I do want to click back on the story. Uh, you mentioned um, actually taking your first accounting course in high school, which is it's in uh, in the area that I grew up in. I don't think there was any offerings along those lines. Like for me, it was um, yeah. I kind of got pulled into it in my first year of college. I was on track to do you know, marketing and communications. Accounting was kind of a prerequisite. Mm-hmm. I you know didn't think much of it, but I you know attended a class and it, and I was so surprised how much it made sense, right? And it caused an effect, debits and credits. Mm-hmm. Was that kind of similar to what like pulled you in? Was it you know, the the kind of logic-based business strategy uh, mindset that that lowered you in? Exactly that. So, I mean, yeah, the beginner accounting course was all just learning exactly what you said, debits and credits, accounting for a transaction. And then as you obviously go more and more up, you learn the complexities of it, right? Making decisions, expressing judgment. How can you through numbers paint a story that you want to tell, right? Because every kind of for transactions is all about judgment. It's all about a, a decision you need to make on how you want to, to show your story. So uh, it was funny though, continuing it through to university, I actually applied to like 12 different programs. I was debating between med sci and sciences and I ended up sticking it out with business. And the decision I made was it's either I go and become a doctor or I become a doctor in the business world. And so uh, that's what led me towards accounting and continuing with that to get my designation. So. Nick, I think we may have a t-shirt idea here. Your <laughs> accountants are doctors for the <laughs> business world. I mean, we do help assess a lot of and diagnose a lot of the issues. I mean, I think we're, and of course, you and I are probably biased, uh, <laughs> but I do think we are in best position. And and let me also say that now that I run a business as obviously um, you know, CEO of my company, the the how you perform in in a business environment uh, represents itself in the numbers that are recorded. Um, and I mean, there is no better way, and I'm sure like any CFO would say that there's no better way to assess the the health performance uh, of a company than through you know the transactions that we record in accounting. So I do think that there is something there to that T-shirt idea. Yeah, and, and it goes toward any. Any type of decision in any business leader, right? Uh, we're we're going through capacity planning right now and planning toward next year for our organization. And uh, the, yes, before I was analyzing financial transactions and assets and liabilities and expenses, but even now it's just you know I'm often asked, do these numbers make sense? And is it telling the story that either I needed to tell or something I need to change because it's not telling what I want to tell? Um, and so. Uh, I, it's an imperative skill that we learn as accountants that I think we just take for granted. And I think that's part of potentially why I 
flipped roles and I'm glad now, obviously when I left as a, to become a solution consultant, it was all about delivering the product and being in a true sales role. But now in people management, managing a division, we're kind of creeping back in towards some of the habits and things that we used to look for, right? You mentioned diagnosing, or we talked about doctors, diagnosing, identifying patterns and trends. You're handy with numbers and you can understand numbers. That's half the battle. So, hundred percent. I, I completely agree with that. And I, I do think also with the type of experiences that you've had, again, speaking from also a little bit of bias, because I, I kind of had the same trajectory as you, you know, starting from the big four to they had been some exposure to industry and now on the technology side. I would love you know, for you to, to, to weigh in on this as well. But I, I think the different angles that uh, you've been able to look at financials and accounting, um, I think all complement each other well. So you, you know, we, we started an audit, it's, you know, top down, right? So understanding financial statements first and, you know, tracing, vouching all the way down. And then in the industry, you're working from the ground up and you're, you know, op- on the operating side, uh, then accounting for transactions. And now on the technology side, like how everything ties in together, I think is such a cool, you know, mix of experiences. I mean, what, does that resonate with you? Yeah. It, it- because at the end of the day, it's exactly that, right? In a role like this, or you become an operator at certain times, but then you also become the, you know, the leader or the organization that you have to draw. Again, it's all about data and all about making decisions, right? But this role, and it's specifically around, you know, in tech, tech is, to me at least, and through where I've worked, it's all about process optimization, right? There's a pain, there's something going on in a process flow, and we're now utilizing technology, whatever technology it may be, to enhance that process. The end result will probably be tied back to some form of a number, right? How much time are we saving? How much more can we process? You know, we release the bottleneck, but it's like you said, it's all those different lenses, right? Earlier on in my career was that top down all around financial statement. Then it was quickly moving into industry as an accountant and documenting those individual transactions and learning some of those processes. Now it's all about kind of the mix of both worlds. In some lenses, I'm in that operator, right? Dealing in, understanding the pain through the different process. And then ultimately now roll kind of 50, 50, cause I get to make some, some fun decisions. Yeah. Well, I, I want to double click on that, uh, because, and, you know, maybe this is coming from my personal perspective and I started my career many, many years ago. We don't have to bring up numbers or anything, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think when I first started, there were less solutions out there in the market. Um, yeah, the, the solutioning aspect that you're describing now and actually spoke about this during yesterday, uh, yesterday's webinar that I was invited in as well. There is so much solutions and tools for different parts of the accounting process that you have to take a strate- strategic approach to selecting which to prioritize and how to go about deploying them. So in essence, the sales role, so sales uh, solution consulting, you know, field sales or whatever the nomenclature is, exactly. um, the, the value in being able to present the situation properly to help prospects and customers make the right decision. It's not like arm twisting in other words. So no, is that, that part of the reason why you got into the, yeah, that particular function? Yeah. So it's exactly that. I think, um, what was really unique. And I think in general, the FinTech space you mentioned right now, there is a software for pretty much every aspect of the financial cycle, right? Every, every time there's something for it. Right. Um, but for me, it was getting that deep understanding of the pains and challenges I had, right being able to articulate, but also like when you flip it into sales, people buy from people who they can empathize with, um, that they can feel from, and it's an authentic feeling, right? Um, being a CPA, being, you know, uh, in the financial process before, when I talk about how draining it is to do accruals, or sometimes it is, you know, it's so difficult to process invoices or feeling the backlog. You can tell when someone's experienced that versus when someone's just talking about it, right? So I think going back to your question it's the deep understanding of how the process works and the pain you've experienced or we've all experienced doing the mundane work of accounting and financial close right but then being able to tie that toward what could and it, for my case because i moved to the software that i acquired and changed my process but that oh, was nice. a living example of what what could be right so i you could flip that around toward well look what could be you can solve this you can gain this time back you can you know, if you're managing a team, your team could be happier and you could retain them longer, right? So it's, I always say there's the feature that we show, but it's not all about the feature. It's about the value that that feature could have, but more importantly, the pain or the value, 
that that, that feature has because it resolves a pain point for a customer. So it's, it's all kind of tied together and that was long and convoluted, but hopefully that made sense. Well, it does. It, it does absolutely. And I, there's another element to it that we should before hopping on here that I think ties nicely into uh, what you just shared there, which is the, the human element, right? So when there's empathy involved in that process, like I know, Nick, what it's like to go through a very mechanical AP invoice processing where you have to chase and also controllers downstream for a check to, to cut. I, you and I living through it. And you being able to share uh, throughout the be with uh, the prospects that you work with, I mean, just enhances that that experience even more. Yeah, it's cool. Like it, I'm afforded the luxury of having not only the domain knowledge but the lived experience. Right, it's all about that relationship, all about that human element. Um, because for me, and this is, was even when I was on the buying cycle. Right, people will forget about the things you say or what you showed but they're always going to remember how you made them feel, right? And it's a quote from Maya Angelou. I'm not going to take credit for it, but it's one of her quotes, what she lives by. It's actually something, it's a quote my mom always lives by, right? But different way, but I'm going to apply it toward uh, toward what we're speaking about here is, you know, during the buying process, it's not about what you buy, it's about who you buy from, right? It's about the, how did they make you feel? Were you given a white glove experience? It could even be, was the person you were speaking with, were they intellectually, like, intellectual enough to actually understand your problem and your pain, where they addressed your question. They didn't have to ask three or four times down, but when you asked something, they understood what it was right away and you were efficient through your buying cycle. So there's so many ways that you can apply it, but it's just, you know, at the end of a demo, at the end of a conversation, at the end of any point in the sales cycle, it's when you take that step back and understand how all these other things come together, it's all that human element, like you just said. Right? You're going to forget about the situation or the feature, or maybe the gap or whatever it is. You'll rely on the customer story. You'll rely on what's shared. You'll rely on, are you laughing throughout the process, right? Or is it super transactional? Are we going through the motions of, okay, we completed our discovery. Now we're going to the demo and then it's a pricing call. Or is there that human element? Are you equally as invested in me and wanting to solve my problem with you? So, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I think, and I also spoke about this yesterday as well. I, I think we're, most of us account start our journeys and our careers, especially if they go through audit, is kind of, and I know we're working with short time frames when it comes to requesting samples, but there tends to be a very transaction. Transactional seems to be survival in some cases. <laughs> uh, but over time and in different roles and functions, especially the one that you're in now, um, yeah, the, the relationship aspect is, is absolutely critical. Uh, so Nick, beyond you know, the relationships and um, and actually just kind of speaking broadly about the role that you're in now, like what have been your biggest learnings? Like, were there any big like aha yeah. epiphanies yeah. and moments? I think um, for me personally, it was kind of proving that I could do this, right? Uh, for the first six years out of, you know, university, I was in accounting and financial reporting. I had like bits and pieces of like different roles that were customer focused, but it was always from that lens of, you know, here's your statement or whatever, maybe um, the tail end of a mundane transaction. But, you know, I thrived on building relationships with people through that journey, right? My my boss who hired me here at Topalti was, he ran my demo when I was a customer. So I, I've come back to that, but just for a quick second, but uh, the aha moment or the learnings was just as accountants, we bring such a valuable skill set to other processes and other industries, specifically for fintech and in this world of solution consulting or solution engineering, right? You are, you're not really an account executive. You're not a sales rep. You're brought in as that technical person who can, it kind of has some undisputed uh, cachet when you walk into the room, right? What you say has a little bit more credibility, um, but it's proving that you can do it. And, you know, the last couple of years I've had just amazing opportunities, whether it was closing my first deal and then the first million dollar quarter and then going to launch the office in the UK, come back and manage the team now. Like it's just truly finding finding kind of what you're meant to be doing. I kind of feel like for the first time in my career, that's where I'm I'm at now. And it's through this lens of taking what I've learned and that domain knowledge and the customer experience and all that, but really with what kind of keeps you excited of going. And I, some of my friends know how miserable I was when I was in accounting and financial reporting and financial close before. Um, 
my family can tell you the same thing. The long hours and all that, that won't necessarily go away all the time. But for me here, it's a different type of stress day to day. It's it's more the, the benefit that way and the benefit can be just pure enjoyment of your job, having conversations with people like yourself or, you know, in half hour from now, I'm going to be on with the prospect, trying to do the exact same thing, solving an hour from that and be having a one-on-one with my team, right? So it's just finding a role, finding a career that can merge everything that makes you tick and everything that excites you. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, for me, the aha moment then, or another one would be, you know, a year after I joined, I referred someone in and Carly, when you see this, because I know Carly will, will see this, you know, that shared experience of moving out from audit to industry or from audit to this role, my team is now almost 50% accounted. And so we've referred people in and that chain has continued because Carly referred in Emmy on my team, right? And I'm naming these people, I'll tag them once this is posted, but it's it's just proof that as accountants at CPA, there's so much more than just financial reporting roles or becoming a controller, becoming a VP finance. We can excel in other areas of business operations. So that yeah. to me was just kind of proof and then living that through others and helping them make some wise decisions to join me, I guess you could say. Yeah, well, well I'd like to add to it. And I have a theory that I've been trying to socialize in the market. Um, and, you know, first of all, I agree, it's kind of the same that trajectory that uh, that I had and in my case, instead of going from traditional kind of accounting roles and kind of going up that standard chain, I started my own practice. I got my hands dirty with a lot of different things, which is great. Um, but I, you know, the way I look at, um, uh, where you and I probably started and where I hope things will change for the profession because it, the profession is still very important to me and it's offered you know, both you and I these opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise. I'd love to see, you know, more of the early accounting professionals like stick and and acquire like all these great skills that we're able to to get access to. Um, but I know they're leaving because automation is causing them to be frustrated, causing a lot of anxiety around being able to execute their jobs properly. And this is why I think you know, solutions like Topalti and Gapify are all incredibly important in preserving. Um, you know, what is truly a good door opener for like younger professionals. And I don't think we get there because, you know, we, we don't have enough, um, we don't have automation being deployed at a fast enough rate to keep this mass exodus that we're now hearing in, in the news and the market. So, you know, I know that's probably uh, a very loaded <laughs> point there, but I guess, you yeah, know, maybe I can uh, synthesize like the question for you. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on where the profession is heading, I guess, is is kind of the general question there. Yeah, so, I mean, I um, I, I love that, specifically in Canada now, um, you can earn your CPA not just from a big four path. And you can actually learn it. Starting point would be just from industry, right? And it, I'm not going to go and say I can accredit people, but um, the premise basically is as long as you're being shadowed by a CPA in whatever role it may be, as long as you still have to prove your competencies in all the finance reporting areas, you don't have such a narrow path to get your CPA anymore. Um, so I think that's obviously a great first step, right? Then it's really cool to see, um, I think as a profession and as, even as a cycle, a work cycle, um, we're kind of all, it's a symptom of being thought of as a cost center, right? We're probably the last ones to get investment for automation, but when you do get it, you can unleash potential, right? The organization out of that, we all moved from processing transactions to being financial business partners. We all enjoyed our life a lot more. The work became a lot more industry. Uh, interesting because we were analyzing trends. We were doing gap analysis. We were supporting, in my case, I happened to support our CRO at the time. So it's, it's hard because there's a couple of things that play there. I think as a profession, specifically in Canada and for sure in the U.S. too. Um, CPAs are embracing more technology, which is great to see. I think there's still a little bit of a lag. Um, I think the nature of the roles, especially for junior accounts to those entering the profession, I think we're going to see a lot more changes pretty soon because, again, the elementary or rudimentary or mundane tasks are all hopefully going to be automated by tech if they haven't already through the use of AI, et cetera. Um, but there's still going to be a need for them. Right, we still have like the job profile is going to change, um, and hopefully it'll just be a lot more interesting work. Um, there'll be other opportunities tied toward together. So 
all the things that we loved about our roles as an accountant, I think we still pretty much do. Maybe a different lens, maybe not as often enough, right? But we we were the first movers to find a way to help utilize tech to spend more of our time on those things we liked. So hopefully it's just the acceleration path that, yes, that'll still exist for those early on in their career, but they'll move past that sooner through the use of technology. Because ultimately you still need to understand what's going on, right? Um, someone still needs to validate and make sure I use the word makes sense and I need to stop saying it, but um, like if someone out there here to make sure it's telling oh, the story this way, telling the story we wanted to tell, right? Like uh, it could be wrong. It could not be wrong. Um, so, but that's my, that's my hope. It's hopefully, you know, the, it'll change, but I still think there's going to be a need for accountants and GPs for sure. Well, I mean, anything, I, two things. One is I'm definitely optimistic. Directionally, it's moving the right way. Of course, like we all like for, for that to uh, move a little bit, uh, quicker, but two, it creates opportunities for the more aggressive accountants to help show the way. Right. And I think exactly. Um, that level of um, evangelization is is a pretty cool role that that yeah it sounds like you and I take a lot of pride in. And, I was gonna um, say we need more people like yourself who who operate this podcast into the living arm of bringing people together within the ecosystem uh, for just the point like you said of being the evangelist, just sharing your story. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited. So it's awesome. Well, having been around and have known the Tipalti brand brand for a while, I know we all kind of uh, share the same sentiment, and I think that's that's special. And yeah, you know, without going into details, I know certain industries and markets you have um, uh, leaders in the category that you know, are just there from a transactional perspective, mm-hmm. right? But clearly, it, with Tipalti, you know, of course, my team. We care about the profession and it's all about supporting them the best we can and i think business results will follow mm-hmm. um follow that um just to wrap things up we have a few minutes left i do want to talk about another trendier topic uh, so yeah. one the one we just spoke about is very top of mind for a lot of teams mass exodus in the profession keeping accountants engaged and in the profession uh, but secondly there's the economic conditions as well right and how that's Factoring into uh, gap buys with Tipalti strategies, and of course, we don't have to get into like the actual yeah. business strategy itself. But you know, how have the current conditions impacted kind of the, yeah. uh, the selling process for uh, for you and your team? So I, I think um, there's a couple things we spoke about earlier that tie in directly here, right? Uh, first and foremost, I think there's a huge opportunity for anyone that can automate a process to to thrive in the environment we're currently in because everyone is being, you know, they're evaluating their own capacity. They're evaluating their growth model that's just right now going into 2024, but it's all about how can I do more with less? And again, at, at the time when we were evaluating a couple of years ago, it was like, okay, we can either outsource to find a way to do it cheaper with those around the world potentially, or we can invest in technology. And I think more and more now people are open to, investing in technology from that point of view though like the, the premise all makes is the same and i you know for those that are selling gapify that for those that are selling to policy having individuals that know that cycle in the sales process incredibly important right going back to we know where the bottlenecks are in the process we can understand that pain people can live it and see it um but i i think more importantly than not it's under identifying that constraint and really like earlier on in our sales cycles and in our discovery calls, discovery happens all the way through the sales cycle. It's not just at the beginning call, but it's being super clear of where their pain points are and running a tailored solution demo of how you can, through specific capabilities, the value you can add to address those pain. Um, people aren't here kind of going through sales cycles happy and jolly anymore. It's, you know, it, it, it is pretty cutthroat because everyone is competitive. We have competitors. Everyone has competition, right? But it's, uh, being the first mover, uh, running a really, really tight sales cycle. So being coordinated with your account executive, with your SDs or solution engineers, with your SDRs, just making sure, hey, when something is really hot, you're moving really quickly, right? And, and for me as an SD, and even th- in a mirror way of what we say we're doing with this podcast, of evangelizing the role for me entirely at the policy. And now that we have a team of accountants on my team specifically, we're constantly enabling other folks. We want, like accounting is not super complicated, but uh, giving them a thoughtful way to learn about it and specifically and tailored to what we're selling, uh, that's proven a huge impact. But I, I think, yeah, going back to the macro trend, uh, 
Um, we were very strong through COVID, where again, there was constraint. We're growing strong and we're experiencing tremendous growth even now, because again, people want to automate. And when you can prove and run a really tight sales cycle that addresses their pain and you again are being people that people want to buy from, it'll only increase your chances. So I think there's an incredible opportunity. I think there, it, it, for process automation, it's not necessarily that it's a luxury, but it's now becoming a need, which is also great, right? And if you're, if you truly are addressing a core financial process that is make or break, that, you know, in our case, it's paying your vendors on time, or it's paying, we even now use the word payee, right? It doesn't need to be a vendor. You could be paying an influencer. You could be paying someone that helps you grow your top line revenue, right? Um, and such a critical process. And this is something I share with my buyer journey at the company I was at previously. Like we were paying out those who created content on our platform. There was an issue there, right? We were sometimes paying them late through the use of the policy. They were paying it on time. They had increased visibility. Now they became advocates of the platform they were authoring on. So they you know, were happier. So it's all it's a symptom of growth, but I think it um, boils down to identifying and understanding your customer's pain proving that you're a need and not a luxury um, and really, really proving that through even an ROI analysis. People are very critical. You have to show, you know, it can't just be the qualitative lovey-dovey through a sales cycle. Mm -hmm. We can make everything look great and I can run an amazing cycle, but if the pain truly really isn't there in the volume or in the transactions or, or that, it's not going to show in the ROI analysis, right? So it's really just making sure we're spending time on, on, on where it's going to make an impact to our customers. So, Me too. Like, that awesome. that address. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that was very comprehensive and I think very valuable for our audience uh, to hear, um, regardless of which siding uh, you're in. So like if you're someone that's looking to invest in software, I think your point's there, even with articulating ROI. Can't just go to your CFO and see best practice 10 times and get the CFO to sign, uh, you know, sign that order form. Uh, but if you can be very explicit about what it is that you're getting out of that investment. And in most cases, uh, especially for automation solutions like the Paul T and, and Gapify, the ROI case is there. You just have to do the work to, uh, and partner with, with our prospects and um, uh, cert, uh, offering providers to, you know, to put all that out. And it should be a partnership. And it goes back to, and ties very nicely back to the human element, right? If you have a genuine interest to help each other, then you should be able to articulate that um, that buying decision in a way that should still be supportable and is actually very helpful in weathering the, the macro conditions. Um, and yeah, I don't think that's necessarily true for all offerings, but I think you know one advantage that obviously uh, the both of us have here is that we um, help on the right side of the P and L, right, which is on the expense mm -hmm. side. Uh, so I, I know that that definitely helps a lot. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can't execute any of that messaging without strong relationships with the people that you work with. And uh, yeah, this is probably like not where accounting conversations typically go. We should have stuck with the numbers <laughs> there, but we didn't. We went more on the, I the I know. song. But I think that's where the industry and the profession really, really needs to go. So I'm glad we, we went the direction that we did. 100%. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an awesome time together. I, I really do appreciate it. So. Thank you for coming on and would love to have you back someday. Of course. Likewise. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Thanks for stopping by. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you want more information, please check us out at gapify.com and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone.